so we'll record it. Um, all right, so welcome. So we'll do, so we'll review for the final. And currently I've scheduled the final, I think I scheduled the final, uh, So, um, all right. What? Are, so, what did I say? Now I'm confusing myself. I think what? you said the seventh. The seventh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's Friday. Okay. Right. Yeah. So we'll set it up for the seventh. All right. Well, let's just go through. I'll, I'll give you. We'll, we'll go through some questions, and uh, we'll cover a lot of the stuff that's going to be on the test. So, so there's going to be some questions about the Viva board uh, that you guys soldered together and have used for 10 labs. So, um, <clears throat> so some of the questions are tangential a little bit, I guess, but so, so the Viva board's got, um, down here. All right, so here's the, here, we'll get this set up. Uh, okay. And all right, so I'll, I'll share this screen. Okay, so um, yeah, so let's we'll go over it. So let me share my screen so you guys can see it. Okay, so here's the there's the Viva board, and um, so you can see it's got some features on it. A little bit of glare there. Maybe we'll shoot. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so um, so first off, it's got uh, it uses the pick. 16F1829 processor, which is an 8-bit processor made by microchip. And um, it's, got, it's got a lot of nice features, um, uh, but it, it's not as powerful as, as uh, some of the 32-bit um, processors. Uh, and it, it has, you know, it has 2K of, uh, or, sorry, 1K of RAM and uh, 8K of programming memory. So it's got a fair amount of programming memory, but Nothing compared to say the 128K that the, the, the KL25Z has uh, that we use in micro two. And then it's got, I guess it's got, um, I don't know, I'm always a little confused about how many memory because it said different things in different places, I think, but, but it's got maybe, si maybe 6K of memory or maybe a little bit more than that of static RAM on, uh, on the KL25Z compared to the 1K on this one. Now, microchip does make much more powerful processors than this, but this is a, the reason we use this one is because the assembly language uh, instruction sets fairly straightforward and it's something you can kind of learn fairly quickly. And that also gives you the ability to, uh, to work with it. All right, so, so one of the features that we have on here, uh, so we have, um, we have some switches, we have a push button here, we've got a slide switch there, and then we have um, a plug for our, or nine volt battery, or you can plug in a five volt source or whatever you, you know, uh, within reason. You shouldn't plug anything more than about uh, nine volts though, because uh, the caps do have a, I think they're rated at 16 volts. So if you plug in 18, they might blow. Um, and then we have, we have a couple of, we, we have some headers. We have headers that bring out all the pins of the micro here, two, pin, two, two spots for every pin. And then we have a, a header for our our CR1, our CR2102, or um, CP2102, however you want to say it. And it, it connects uh, to a UART to USB uh, converter. It takes your UART, your TT level UART, converts it to USB, and lets you plug it into your desktop or laptop and open up a terminal program and see stuff, which you've all done. And then we have, um, we have a three pin jumper here that lets you jump between uh, 3.3 volts and 5 volts, which are both uh, created by these two linear voltage regulators, one kicking out 5 volts if you put in a 9 volt battery and one kicking out 3.3. And you select it there with this jumper. Uh, in the other position, the jumper selects between 
the 3.3 input from the CR2102 and the five volt input. So you have a couple different ways of getting that. The 3.3 and the five from this are not quite as accurate as the ones from, from the, if you put in a nine volt battery and use these two. Um, there are uh, four touch buttons um, indicated by the letters U, T, S, and A. Those are the actual metalized portions. And then we covered over those with uh, paint to make them more visible. In the old days, the boards actually looked like this. And it was kind of hard to see your touch buttons. They're there. Uh, if you angle it just right, you can kind of see them. Yeah, you can kind of see them now. So, but we put these on. And actually, that was a that was a nice upgrade. Um, and then, um, and then we have a header over here for an analog little analog board that plugs in. And the little analog board has um, has, as you know, has plugs in here, and it has on it a temperature sensor and a uh, photoresistor and a potentiometer. And there, the, each of them has an analog output. And those analog outputs are brought to these three pins, which connect to RC2, RC3, and RB5, and then power and ground. Because uh, all of these require, uh, you have to bias them. Or, you, or in the case of the temperature sensor, you have to power it. Really, it's biasing that one too. And that, uh, that gives us the ability to have these different analog inputs. Um, all right, and so uh, so those are some of the features. The, the, the push button is set up with a, its own th little three pin jumper and we can put a jumper on the, on the, on the push button and we can uh, set it up so that we can jumper it to connect it to pin RB7. And we also have um, associated with that, this little pull up resistor here. And also there's a little cap there just in case too. Uh, and then on this other pin, so we have a, this pull-up resistor is actually, uh, I think it's, I actually don't remember. I don't know if we can see it good enough to read it. it it's, you, we use, when I first did it, we always put on 10Ks, but I changed it so that now, now we're putting on, it's something more like a, something more like a much higher value. Yeah, I think it's 100Ks what it is. It's 100K, one zero zero with a three at the end. So that's 100K. And then the other one's a 10K. And the 10K pull up is there uh, to give you a way to, uh, to, do the, to use a master clear function with the push button. So if you have it over here on these two pins, shorting these two pins, it works as a master clear. If you short these two pins, it works as a, uh, our, it works as a push button input. And the 100K ohm resistor, uh, is connected, and I, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I think, I think even if you're not jumpered, I believe the 100k ohm resistor is still connected to RB7. That is one of the liabilities of RB7. Uh, that that means you, if you need to use it as a totally floating pin, uh, you can't do that uh, because it is pulled up with 100k, which isn't much. Might be okay. For some circuits, but if, if they require a pure, pure floating pin, that'll be a problem. Anyway, and then we have an RGB LED. And so you should know some things. The, the push buttons have, um, the, the touch buttons are, are nice and convenient. You have to, of course, program the, the, the chip to recognize them. You have to use the touch sensing module, which is actually an updated, an, an outdated module. Uh, they don't make that module anymore. Uh, and the reason they quit making it is because uh, it has a little bit of a fatal flaw in it. And they use a very similar technique, but it's, it's slightly different. Uh, they use, they use it uh, instead of the, the touch sensing module, which has a, an RC oscillator for which the, the touch button represents the capacitance. And when you touch it, you increase the capacitance and slow down the oscillator. That's how this works. But the, uh, the new one that they've gone to uh, uses a, it has it uses the A to D module, the A to D converter, and it um, it it's it. Uh, I yeah I don't know I I I think I think I've actually forgotten that, how to describe it exactly. Uh, I have to go back and read the the description again. But uh, it comes with its own set of assembly of, of assembly language routines that you have to use, uh, and it basically it basically does it it's. It counts, but it varies things around a little bit so that if you have 
a fixed noise uh, at a certain frequency, uh, that that can be an that can be a very difficult problem that you really can't eradicate with the uh, with the the touch module um, using uh, the local oscillator the way this is set up. You 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 can't really fix that, but uh, but the with the uh, A to D converter you can, uh, and the A to D converter they need they need a special one. They need they need the A to D converter that that has the ability to do uh, some calculations uh, called an ADCC, uh, an analog to digital converter calculating. And so it'll do things like, uh, like average uh, and compare, uh, compare the A to D value to two thresholds and it can be above them, below them, uh, or inside the two thresholds uh, between the two limits. And so, so that's, how they, that's how they currently do touch sensing in, this, in these, uh, in their, um, at least in these eight-bit modules, I'm not sure what they do in the in the bigger chips. All right, so um, we use the Snap Programmer on our programming port over here, which it's a six-pin header, but we actually only use only five of the pins are actually used, and the pins we use we use the the Master Clear pin, which is which goes into RC3 right here, and then we use uh, power, ground, and then we, we, use, we have two pins, one for the, uh, the clock and one for the data uh, for the debugger, which also works as the programmer. And those two pins are, are using uh, RA1 and RA0, uh, RA0 and RA1. So we basically use RA0, RA1, and RC3 off the pick, as well as, of course, power and ground. And that's how we program it. And we can also use that programmer as a debugger. So it's a programmer debugger. Now, pr probably most of you didn't do, didn't use it to do much debugging. I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna write a debug lab next semester and make everybody use the debugger. Um, but uh, I haven't ever had the idea to do that before. Uh, but there are some really powerful debug features on it that, that can really help you debug your code if you're, you've got a tricky problem that you can't solve. All right, uh, so, um, all right. Um, the other, the other thing it has on it, a couple other things. It does have two transistors here, which are very hard to see. Um, I don't know if we can make it. Maybe we can make it a little better. Yeah. So one is right here, and the other is right there. There's one, and here's the other one. One's a one's a two N twenty nine zero six, and one's a two N twenty nine zero four. And together they make this two transistor switch, which if you plug in and put plug into these pins and make these a one, you'll turn it on and you'll connect whatever the battery power plugged into the jack is. If it's a nine volt battery, then you'll get nine volts on this terminal and ground on that terminal. And then if you put a zero in, then this terminal goes to ground essentially. And, and it can handle about a hundred milliamps, maybe 150, that's about it. And it, and it uses two transistors and, and uh, I think four resistors. Um, and then we have a few resistors at current limit for the RGB, R, RGB R LED. And then we have two pull-up resistors right here that are used for uh, the two I squared C pins, R, RB, RB uh, <clears throat> four and RB six. <coughs> so, and that's, that's pretty much what's on it. The only other thing we have, uh, two bypass capacitors right here. They're slightly different values. You can actually see one's, one's bigger than the other. It's quite a bit taller. Uh, you can see it better this way. And um, so one, I think one is like uh, 4.7 uh, uh, microfarads and the other is maybe like 0.1. And we have the same thing up here. We have a, we have a, bigger, a bigger cap there and two little ones. And those basically provide the filtering to help the linear regulators work efficiently. And then we have the LEDs up here to show that the power is connected and uh, they both have their current limiting resistors. And that's pretty much the whole Viva board. Uh, we know that this board can be powered uh, anywhere from 1.8 to 5.5 volts, but our, our current limiting resistors run, uh, our, our linear regulators run it, give us 3.3 and five. And the reason we chose those values is because uh, if we want to interface it to something, some of the things we might want to interface to 
need five volts and some need 3.3. And sometimes you can run the board at one voltage and the interface at another, but it's kind of nice. The one nice thing though, if you do have these pins jumpered uh, to connect say uh, 3.3 to the, to the chip and the rest of the board, then that leaves the five volt pin available and you can just put a, a wire on that and use that to power some peripheral if you need to. So you can actually have, uh, you can always get both the voltage up, voltages off the board. Um, okay. And then, uh, so um, yeah, it, as time goes on, our microprocessors seem to want to run at lower and lower voltages. Um, and that's partly because the, the, uh, the we're using smaller and smaller um, uh, feature sizes uh, when we make the integrated circuits these days. Uh, I mean, there are some circuits now that I think the feature size is down to uh, seven, eight, nine nanometers. Maybe there's even some at, uh, working at five nanometers. Uh, 10 nanometers has been around for a while. Uh, and then 28, 29 nanometers is pretty common. Uh, this chip is probably 150 nanometers. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I think that's right. And partly because part of Microsoft's, uh, uh, my, sorry, part of microchip strategy has been to, to build some of their own foundries with equipment that uh, other foundries have, have uh, upgraded from. And so they've gotten the, the cheaper foundry equipment for the, for the wider, the bigger feature sizes at you know, bargain discount prices. And so that's really helped them to be more efficient. And in the end, these chips are pretty small. Uh, you can even get them in smaller dies and smaller sizes than this. And really size is not one of the limiting, was not one of the limiting factors really. But, um, and, they don't, and they're only running this at 32 megahertz at the maximum. We mostly run it at 16. Um, so uh, we talked a little bit about the KL25Z. I did cover it in some detail. And, and I'll just talk a little bit about that now. Uh, just so you can kind of know, um, you know what uh, what some of the, you know what some of the differences are. All right, so uh, we have on the KL twenty five Z and the PIC sixteen, we do have um, uh, they both have stack pointers, but um, the stack pointer on the PIC points to a sixteen register fixed hardware stack that can't be relocated, and um, on the KL twenty five Z, you have a thirty two bit register, and you can you can put your your stack any you can start you can have the pointer point to your stack and and initialize it anywhere you want in memory normally you initialize it at the top of random access memory and the stock and the stack builds down into the memory and you then you normally put your variables starting at the bottom of random access memory and the the, the variables and and other registers you use for 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 your program build up into the into the memory now of course the instructions are put in random are are put into the 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 flash ROM, and that's true in this chip as well. Uh, we put we put all the uh, instructions into the ROM, and if you create constants, uh, most of the time the compiler in MP Lab, uh, the X C eight compiler in MP Lab uh, X will uh, put all your constants in program memory. In addition to that, all of the um, all of the uh, the configuration words are actually words in program memory. Uh, and so those, when you flash the chip, uh, you're writing things into program memory and that's where you write in the configuration words. Um, <clears throat> so so uh, the, uh, the, the PIC is a Harvard-based machine. I'm sorry, yeah, is a Harvard-based machine and it has a separate uh, address bus and a separate data bus for the data part of its memory and a separate one then for the program part of its memory. And they're not the same size. The address bus in the program part of the memory is 15 bits and the data bus is 14 bits because all the instructions, uh, all the instructions are 14 bit instructions. So, so, on the, so on the instruction side of your memory, you have 14 bit word sizes and the data bus is 14 bits wide. And because you can have up to 32K in some of the chips in this family, your instruction, your address bus for the program memory is 32, it's, uh, sorry, it's uh, 15 bits. 
So it can go up to 32K. On the data side, the uh, data bus is eight bits. All of the, all the special function registers, all the random access memory locations, um, you know, all that stuff is all eight bits. And, uh, and uh, so a few of them like the BSR five bits, um, the program counter latch high is, is seven bits. So there's a few that aren't quite a full eight bits, but, but other than those couple, everything else is eight bits on the data side. And so when you uh, write something to memory, uh, you're writing eight bits at a time. And the memory location is an eight bit location. Now on the KL25Z, uh, it is a von Neumann architecture. And what that means is that it has that everything, it, ha it only has one address bus, it only has one data bus. And, but in this chip, because it's a 32 bit chip, the data bus is 32 bits wide and the address bus uh, is, uh, is also 32 bits. It, does, it wouldn't have to be that, but that's what they made it. And that 32 bit address bus then can address up to four gigabytes of stuff. Now it only has like 6K of, of static RAM and it only has 128K of program memory. And then it has maybe a few more K uh, of register spaces and, and pin registers and stuff. Maybe, maybe as much as another, I don't know, maybe another 100K, but probably not. So all total, it, it doesn't even have, it doesn't even have a quarter of a megabyte uh, of, of memory uh, take, of, of address space used really. Now they do map, uh, they do have uh, regular speed uh, GPIO pins, and then they have another address space that's mapped for high-speed GPIO access that can do. They call them decorated loads and stores, and it's kind of a it's kind of an exotic feature that uh, I haven't er actually ever used. I don't know if the compiler takes advantage of it or not. I, I don't think it does. Um, all right, so 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 as far as uh, as flash memory, the PIC sixteen has eight K. And the KL25Z has 128. The PIC16 has 14 bit instructions. The KL25Z has mostly 16 bit instructions, but it does have a few 32 bit S, uh, 50 16 bit instructions, and six uh, 32 bit instructions. Whereas the, in the PIC, every single instruction is exactly 14 bits. Um, the, uh, both of these chips will have very similar modules. They have timers, they have PWMs, they have A to C's, D to A's. Uh, they have touch sensing. They, they have uh, capture and compare. Uh, they have quite a few things. Uh, UART, but the, the KL25Z has, it's a lot of its peripherals are a little fancier than the ones on this particular pick. Of course, it's a 32-bit chip. This is an 8-bit chip, so it is a little fancier. Um, and it has, um, and it has more timers. It has, has a lot more features. Um, and uh, the KL25Z can do a whole bunch of different levels of sleep, uh, rather unlike the PIC where you really just get one level. The, the chip's either running or it's asleep. Now the PIC can do some things in sleep and so can the KL25Z, but the KL25Z has, I think about four different levels of sleep. So, and in different levels, different things are continuing to function. Um, all right. So there are some advantages to micros having on-chip peripherals like PWM, A to D, UART. And so, so I'll probably ask you some questions about that. So if, you know, so one of the reasons why we have uh, peripherals on, why, why we like microprocessors with a bunch of peripherals on them is because it can often give us a, a single chip solution to an embedded design, or you might have to have some, a few other chips on there, but uh, you won't, you know, you can, you may be able to do all of your processing in, in one microprocessor that has all the appropriate modules. So that's really nice. Um, uh, and of course that result, that results in smaller circuits. Uh, and it also lets your, your printed circuit boards have fewer components. If you have to have a bunch of support chips, uh, maybe you'd have to have an A to D chip, and then you have to have a, um, um, you know, uh, maybe a, a, a chip to, uh, uh, to, to run a comparator. Uh, maybe you need a, a, a D to A chip. And so if you have those capabilities built into your 
to your microprocessor chip, that saves you a lot of extra chips, makes your PC board smaller, lets you save costs when you, uh, when you fabricate it, and it lets you add a whole bunch of additional features if you want uh, at maybe no extra cost or very, very minimal extra cost, just a little extra programming cost. Um, and not only that, but when a chip has a lot of different modules on it that can be configured and used in many different ways, um, that chip can be used for a, a whole host of projects. So you might do one uh, you know, uh, project with uh, say the KL25Z, and then you might turn around uh, and use that same chip for an entirely different project because it has that capability. Same thing with a PIC chip. You might use the PIC chip for a, for a, a, a simple project, and then you might turn around and use it for an entirely different uh, project with, with more features. Um, and these, these, these chips are really surprisingly capable. Uh, they can just do a lot of different things. And um, it, it, so you can find yourself um, using the same chip for lots of different things. And, and then in the case of um, different families of chip, uh, in, in, the, in the microchip world, uh, the families have an extensive range of components. I, I don't know how many 8-bit micros uh, uh, are made by microchip, but I mean, it's a ton of them. And uh, so you can probably find one for just about any project you need. And then if you need to go up, maybe you're gonna process video and you want something a little more powerful, then you go up to their 32-bit processors or their digital signal processors, and you can use those as well. And they also have, uh, they also have, uh, uh, they also have other 8-bit chips that are even more capable than the the PIC 16 line. They have the PIC 18 line, also 8-bit chips, but they have uh, you can have different levels of priority on the interrupts, uh, whereas in uh, on the 8-bit line you can't. Um, so. Um, let's see. Um, so there, there are a number of features that microprocessors provide that make them attractive for battery operated devices. One of them is a pretty small size. Um, if you were going to build a project, say around your laptop, uh, that'd be great. But if it was going to run for hours and hours and hours, you'd have to have some really serious battery backup. Uh, whereas uh, a, a nice a nice healthy battery for the for this for the pick chip, especially if you take advantage of putting it to sleep when it's not really needed to do much. Uh, you can get this thing to last on the same battery for a long time. Uh, my my mouse has a processor in it. I don't know what chip they use. I should take one apart and see. But uh, the batteries in this mouse can can last a year if I you know if I turn it off from time to time. But it it only really wakes up and does stuff when you move it. Just kind of, you know, which really helps preserve the battery. Um, so, what are some things that would would make you uh, make make your uh, uh, processor or your your design better for mobile operations? Well, one of the things you certainly don't want to do is use linear regulators. If any of you have left your nine volt battery plugged in, you know that um, the battery will be discharged overnight uh, if you don't unplug it, even with the switch off because these regulators are still drawing about 20 milliamps each um, uh, just when they're doing nothing. Uh, and so, so that's, that's gonna drain a battery over time. So you wouldn't wanna use linear regulators. You probably wanna use a buck converter or maybe you just run the processor at your battery voltage. And as the battery voltage drops, now, you, now then you have to turn on your, your brownout detection so that once it gets to a point where the microprocessor might quit working, which is anything below 1.8 volts, uh, you might you might want to have it gracefully shut down so so it doesn't uh, so it doesn't shut down in an ungraceful way. As you take power, as you take the voltage below 1.8 volts, then the the operation of the microprocessor becomes unreliable, and it may execute some instructions, and other instructions it may misexecute because gates aren't firing properly, and all sorts of crazy things can happen. And as a result. Um, you, you don't want that to happen. You could even erase part of your code. You could, uh, if you have features in, in, your, in your project that, that, are, that are powerful or have uh, high voltage or running big servos, you could, you could do real damage. So you, you want to gracefully power it down if you're running it like that. But you can, and that way you don't have any power wasted in your linear regulator. 
Um, so one of the things that's really helpful and the KL25Z provides for this is you can shut clocks off to any module you're not using. Whereas in the PIC, you can't really do that, but that does save additional power. Now in the PIC, if you turn off, if you like, there's some of the modules you can turn off and then that, that does really cut down any power usage. Um, there, the multi levels of, of, of sleep does make it more attractive for battery operation. Uh, simple sleep where it's either all the way on or all the way off is, is less flexible. Um, the uh, having really fast clocks though, doesn't really help you for a mobile operation uh, because actually the faster you run the chip, the more power it uses. So what's really more, more desirable is to have, to be able to pick from a range of clock speeds or even to change your clock speed on the fly. So you might, you might run it at a very low clock speed most of the time. And then maybe for a certain task you're trying to do with it, uh, you could ramp the clock speed up to its maximum speed, let it do that task. When that task finishes, you could throttle it back down to the low clock speed and save a lot of energy. Um, you can also, um, yeah. Um, and it's also nice to have a lot of different ways to wake things up from sleep. And both the, both the KO25Z and the PIC are pretty good about that. Um, it's also nice to have the on-chip clock generation so it can generate its own clock and, and doesn't require any extra components which also use up their own power levels. So, um, so having on-chip clock generation is good, but then if you wanna run it off of, a, off of a crystal or a resonator and have it very accurately, uh, very accurate clock, uh, then, you can, then you have that option as well. And the PIC will let you do that as will the KO25Z. Um, we, I looked at the, we brought the clock out in one of the lectures and we looked at it with a scope. We saw that it's, uh, when we're running it at four megahertz, our instruction cycle was very, very close to, to, uh, to one megahertz. So maybe off by, uh, well, maybe a 10th of a percent or less, maybe 0.01%. So pretty accurate. Okay. So what are some things that, that, uh, uh, what are some trends in, designs. Well, one of the trends is, of course, is that we're moving to higher level languages uh, from assembly language. And that, that transition is probably almost complete. I, I bet there are very few designs still being done in assembly language now. There might be some uh, where, where you're trying to do a, maybe make a simple child's toy and you just have a, a very small set of instructions. You might, you might have a chip with a very small amount of memory that would save money and, and you would have to write your code in assembly language in order to make it work. Uh, that may still be happening in, in a few cases, but for most things, we're not really, uh, we're, we're not really seeing that happen anymore. Uh, we're mostly writing in C. And uh, so what are some features that, that, uh, uh, that push those designs that way? Um, well, uh, so one is that we have better compilers, uh, less expensive compilers and optimizing compilers that uh, can take, uh, uh, that, can, that can get that C code down to a much smaller number of assembly language instructions um, so, that, uh, so that you can have a fairly complicated code, but still not you know, fit it into your microprocessor. Um, we're also writing projects that are more complicated. Uh, most of the projects now have some extra features on them and to implement those features takes a little more software or firmware. And so obviously um, uh, that's one of the things that makes you want to do it in a higher level language so that you can uh, uh, have more support as you debug it and you can write it faster. Um, having multiple wake up, uh, having, having the ability to use sleep also can cause you to, to uh, have somewhat more complicated code. Uh, you can also do more uh, mathematical crunching and more complicated algorithms if you have a very fast clock. So that definitely would push you to a higher level uh, language. Having complicated uh, modules on the chip that let you do uh, you know, fancy things like your, um, like your A to C can read in 32 values and average them before it, uh, you know, wait, before it uh, generates an interrupt and says, you know, you know come get your result. Um, so those are, those are other things. Development cycle times. When our, our development cycle times are, are, are becoming more and more competitive to get stuff to market, 
you may find yourself, uh, you have to write in an assembly in a, in a higher level language because you don't have time to, to do it in a more tedious assembly language. Um, and uh, we also have a lot more surface mount parts on our, on our boards, but those don't have anything to do really pushing us towards higher level languages. They just make for smaller, uh, smaller designs. And, um, um, but definitely anytime you start using anything but the most simplest of basic of all math, then you will find assembly language very, very constraining. And that does definitely push you to, uh, to the more complex math. And also user interfaces are, are just notoriously uh, complicated. And it's always good if you can write those in a higher level language. Um, all right, what happens if you, uh, uh, let's talk about the pins on, the, on the, the pick a little bit. One of the things that's often, um, let's see, I think I'm gonna pull up the data sheet for this. Let me see if I can do this. Um, so let's, let's do that real quick. Um, Let's see, here we go. I think. Uh, did, yeah, I think it did. Yeah, but where is it? Oh, here it is. Okay. All right, so uh, one of the, there's, there are several things in here that are really good to know. Uh, one of them is, if you go into, um, let's see, so let's look at uh, I.O. ports. Here's the, here's the generic I.O. port block diagram. You should, you should definitely look at this and make sure you understand it, because um, this really tells you a lot about the part. And I, and I do include one of the videos, one of the video lectures goes over this extensively. But let me just review the highlights. So a couple of things you definitely need to know. Uh, the, the latch command and the port commands work differently. The latch command reads and writes the flip-flop. Every pin, this is your I.O. pin. So this connects to the outside world. And all the rest of this stuff is internal circuitry. The first, time you, the first thing we run into are these reverse bias diodes that provide some static electricity protection to the pin and also provide a little bit of protection to a pin if you uh, stress it or overdrive it, try and draw too much current or try and feed sink too much current or, a, or stick a higher voltage on it uh, or a negative voltage. These are things that'll, that'll protect the internal uh, integrated circuitry. Uh, so they have these protection diodes on the right next to the pin. And then next, we, we start between the analog function and uh, the digital function. Now this, this doesn't, show the analog parts, but this just shows that the, uh, the AND cell pin, and it should really have a bubble on it, because when the AND cell pin is cleared, then this AND gate works and things go, can go through. When this AND gate is closed, then there's no digital input available from the pin. And that's why if you don't, if you don't clear the AND select bit for, your, for a pin, when you're trying to use it as an input, you're gonna have a tough time. Now, we wisely and carefully chose RB7 that does not have an analog function. So there's no and so bit for that. So that input's gonna work even if you forget to clear the and select and cell bit because there's no and cell bit for that pin. Um, but uh, if you use other pins for IO, uh, most of the pins, uh, 12 of the, of the, so there's 20 pins on the chip, two for power and ground, and the other 18, 12 of them have analog functions. So there's only six without analog functions. And that includes the master clear. So if you take away the master clear, there's really only five bits, five pins without analog functions on them. And so that's, a, that's good to keep in mind. Okay, so when you, when you read, when you, well, when you write the port, it, it, also, it also writes the latch. But the problem with that it, what makes the latch instruction and the port instruction very different is that they both do what's called read, modify, write. When you write, when you read, when you write the latch, the first thing it does is read all the all the pins in that port, and then it writes back out to the you. Then you, then it changes the pin you're trying to change and writes that information then back out. Well, in the case of the latch, you're reading the latch and you're writing the latch back out. 
this flip-flop here. But in the case of the reed, you're actually reading the pin, but riding the latch. And there may be some pins in your setup where you misread the pin or the pin reads what's not in the latch. And you may wind up changing what's in the latch when you do a read and not a, and not a, a when you do a, a write to the port instead of a write to the latch. You should always write to the LATA, LATB or LATC when you're writing a pin and you should reserve your, 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 uh, your, uh, uh, your port command, you should reserve that where you, where you read uh, PTA, PTB, whatever, you know, PTB1, PTB2, or whatever, or you read port B, port A, port C. You should, you should re reserve those for reads and not use those for writes. But you can use them for writes. It's just that on rare occasion, the read, modify, write thing may uh, cause some unexpected behavior. All right. Uh, and you can see this directly. We have a buffer here, a buffer here, and a buffer here. So this buffer is activated when the read command is executed. And, it, and if, if the ANSEL bit is set correctly and the, the TRIS bit is set for input, then you'll read what's coming in on the pin. And it'll be clocked to the data bus and you'll, and you'll get it. If on the other hand, uh, you're reading the latch, you're, this is the, read, the latch read buffer here. And this tri-state buffer then is activated and what's on the flip-flop comes out of the flip-flop and goes into the data bus. So you're actually reading the flip-flop when you read the latch. Uh, when you're in analog mode, then uh, this AND gate turns off the, uh, all, the, all the information flowing in here and you just have your analog connection, which is not really shown. Um, and then sometimes the peripheral modules will come in here and they'll actually, uh, they'll be able, they'll use this pin directly, but in order to make that work uh, as an in, as well as an input or an output, you have to make the pin an input. That's why when we like in our UART, both of our both our transmit and our and our receive lines are set up as inputs, but the UART sends its signal directly down this line and out the pin. So it's actually it's actually an output, but it works because this buffer is not is not gating on the flip flop output. It's, it's tri-stated and, and that allows the peripheral then to totally control the pin. True for I squared C and true for several other features. So, so you, you always have to set the, when you want uh, digital function, you make, have to make sure that the end cell bit's clear and you have to make sure that if you're using it for a module that you've, in most cases, you clear the tris bit. Now in the case of uh, PWM, we use this flip-flop. So we actually, uh, we actually, Sorry, set the, the other, I should have said set the clear bit. For this though, we clear the clear bit, make it an output. So again, when the tris bit is a one, it's, it, this buffer is, is not connected. It's tri-stated. When the, when the tris bit is a zero, this buffer is connected and it's outputting the flip-flop output. Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, it's, you know, if you're a design engineer, you probably want to, you probably want to get very familiar with a, a chip line that has lots of different options and a really good integrated development environment and, uh, and, and a wide selection of different parts you can use for different projects. And then once you get familiar with all that, you can uh, do a number of different projects and you, you may not even have to switch chips, but, but you can also, if you need to switch chips, there are other chips that are available to you with uh, different modules available, but having very similar um, uh, a very similar programming environments, instruction sets, and, and features that you don't have to relearn. Um, when, you, when you write your code, you definitely want to uh, comment it, and you would like to do your code in, in the cleanest way you can. What you don't want to do is, is have these very complicated, tricky uh, constructs that only you know about and nobody else is going to be able to figure out without pulling their hair out, because somebody may very well have to have to uh, maintain your code down the road, or may, they may there may be other people working on the project as well, and they'll have to to connect their parts to your code, and you may be uh, you know you may be on a beach someplace kicking back and 
getting all sorts of phone calls because you didn't document your code or you did something that was really strange and nobody can figure it out. So you definitely want to avoid that. You do want to use a lot of function calls um, because uh, when you break your project down into, into logical blocks and then you build functions for each of those blocks and you debug those blocks individually and you know those blocks are working correctly, then you can, you can put those blocks together in your main routine and, and really make your project run pretty in a pretty straightforward way. And it does make it a lot easier to debug. The other thing is you can reuse those functions in other projects if you make them nice and generic. Um, so when you, if you're managing a project team, one of the things you wanna make sure you do is, uh, is allow some additional time uh, for the software part. You can expect that the hardware part will go along pretty quickly and that, but you may have some hiccups and problems getting the software uh, all, all done just the way you want. It, it just seems like it's inevitable that the software is always the long pole in the tent. Um, user interfaces. Again, remember when you do a, when you develop a, an embedded project, all the user sees for the most part uh, is the user interface. And if your user interface is bad, uh, the user is going to be really irritated as they have to use your code. And so you do wanna spend a lot of time on the user interface. Um, you, you wanna build in features, you wanna use additional features that are available like the watchdog timer. So the watchdog timer can, can if, if for some reason there's a little glitch, uh, a power surge or, or a lightning strike or something that causes a little bit of static you know, effect and screws up your processor, particularly if it's, if it's mounted in a remote location, you'd, you'd love to have the watchdog timer turned on so that then if you get in some kind of crazy, you know, infinite loop someplace or you get stuck in a dead end instruction someplace that, that, your, that your watchdog timer will time out and reset your code and start you over and, and save your bacon. So that's always good. Um, the, uh, so, one of the features we didn't really do a lot because it, it kind of takes away from some of your learning, uh, but it's a feature you need to, to have to over time, depending on assuming you do a better design, you're gonna wanna use the, the, the features in your, in your integrated development environment that will build code for you. Um, in Microsoft's MP Lab X, it's called the MCC, Microsoft Code, Microsoft code Configure, or sorry, Microchip Code Configure. Uh, and this is really nice. It gives you a GUI interface for uh, setting for for configuring the A to D converter timers and a whole bunch of stuff, and it gives you all the valid options, and it lets you select things. And when you want to see, uh, let's see, I, I want a you know 3.2 millisecond pulse or, or time window in my timer, and and you 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 don't want to have to do all the long hard figuring it out. Uh, you can actually go into these GUI interfaces and <clears throat> click a few things, and it'll tell you how many seconds your, your, timers, your timer period is set for. And then you can make a few adjustments, change the uh, prescaler or whatever, and you can uh, change the count number. Oh, or you can get it dialed in so it's exactly the, the interval that you want. And it does all that for you and shows you in real time if you make the changes, what the new value is, what the new uh, timer period is. And the same thing for a number of the modules. So that feature is available in MP Lab X for our chip. We just didn't use it uh, because it makes it a little too easy for you. Um, but those are features you should learn. The KL25Z has the same thing uh, and it, it's very nice. It's actually in, in uh, the new program that now supports it called uh, MC Lab Express, or no, um, MCU Expresso. It, it has a very nice uh, help system. It's not fully populated for the KL25Z, but there are other uh, similar modules that it, that it will be, uh, that it'll do everything for you. So, um, all right. So, and that's definitely the trend. The trend more and more is to make this code development as fast and as easy as possible. So you can get your, your product out the door on time. Um, okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about a few of the modules. Um, so the A to D module, so you should know that the A to D module uh, is a 10 bit, has 10 bits of resolution. Now you can, you can use less of them and, and get less, but it, it is a 10 bit module. And it has, uh, 
eight bits, you, it, 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 because you have eight bit registers, you have an A to D RES low and an A to D RES high register. And so that, that 10 bit result can be slid to the left or slid to the right so that you, you have it left or right justified. Um, it, the A to D converter does use successive approximation and, um, and uh, there are 12 A to D channels available on, on our board on that pick. Um, so if, if whenever you do the, the 10 bit result, you always wind up with eight bits in one register and two bits in the other. And you can have either the, the low order two bits or the higher order two bits can be in the opposite register, depending on how, whether you right or left justify. You're only allowed to use uh, the, re the reference voltages for the A to D converter are definitely can never go lower than ground or VSS, and they can no, be no greater than the power, the voltage you're running your chip at. So if you're running at five volts, they can't be any more than five. Um, and it takes about 13 uh, conversion clock cycles to get your A to D result. And you can use it if, you're, if your clock's running at four megahertz, you can, you can actually, you can do the FOS divided by four or the one megahertz rate. Um, for, for external signals that say are plus or minus one volt, how can you put those into your A to D converter? Well, you basically have to use a, uh, uh, a, a little op amp and uh, condition the signal. So now, now it varies between ground and say 3.3 volts. And you can do that easily with a single op amp. You can DC shift them and provide a little amplification or a little attenuation, whatever's required. Um, uh, <clears throat> So your PWM module, remember there's the, when you change the amount of energy delivered to a device, you're changing the duty cycle. Uh, you can adjust, <clears throat> you can also change the pulse period, but the pulse period just, just changes the frequency at which the pulses are delivered. And this is, this is critical for some things like servos need, need a pulse, uh, a pulse uh, frequency that's within a certain range. Uh, and that is usually it, it's supposed to, the, pulse, the whole pulse repetition interval is supposed to be 20 milliseconds or 50 Hertz for a servo. Uh, for, for a H bridge, for a motor, for a DC motor, you probably want to run it at maybe seven, uh, maybe six or seven kilohertz. And then for controlling the, the brightness of an LED, you probably want to go maybe to you know ten kilohertz or, or so something where you're way 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 away from uh, any audio level signal and and you're fast enough that there won't be any any hint of uh, blinking and and when you look at the light. But in an LED, you don't want to blink it so fast that um, that the LED doesn't have time to fully turn off and fully turn on. And if you if you don't follow that, then then the LED may not, you may not be able to control the brightness uh, like you would like to. And if you're using like a, like a seven segment display, display, which has LEDs in it, and you're driving that, you're multiplexing that, which is what we often do. Your multiplex frequency has to be, has to be uh, slow enough that you're, not, that you're not leaving segments trying to turn on and off and they can't quite do it physically fast enough. And then you get streaking and smearing and all sorts of funky looks to your display. So you have to pick that, that, that pulse repetition frequency has to be sort of picked with the sweet spot. Um, all right. Um, and we, we often use a PWM signal because we're trying to control nonlinear things. Um, so let's see, interrupts. So, so you, you know that there are several things that can cause interrupts. Almost all the modules, all the peripheral modules like the A to D module, when it finishes a conversion, it can cause an interrupt. Uh, the PWM module, when it starts a new PWM cycle, it can cause an interrupt. Um, and every, when timers time out, they can cause interrupts. Uh, when a touch button is touched, you, you can, well, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess that, uh, no, that probably, I don't know that that one does cause interrupt. You, you, you would have to generate that interrupt. Um, but uh, then you, some of your individual pins can cause interrupts. Uh, we have uh, what's called the interrupt on change pins. That's registers uh, A and B. Uh, register C doesn't have any interrupt on change pins, uh, but A and B does. 
Uh, and normally one of the first things we do when we go into our ISR is we close the flag that triggered the interrupt. Now to get an interrupt, you usually have, you, you, you always have to have on the global interrupt enable bit. And then you have to have, maybe you have to turn on the peripheral interrupt enable bit for that peripheral. And then you have to turn on the specific, uh, the, the significant, the specific, uh, well, then you have to turn on the, the global, the peripheral interrupt enable bit that enables all of the peripheral interrupts. Now, there are some interrupts that are not, not in the peripheral interrupt registers and those have their own uh, bits. And that would be timer zero uh, and, uh, and the interrupt on change uh, as well. They, they, don't, they, don't have, they don't require those PIE bits, but most of the modules do. Um, the, uh, there is an interrupt. Uh, so on the PIC chip, there is a single interrupt vector. All interrupts when they occur, go to the location four in program memory and start executing code there. And usually you put a jump there to go to your interrupt service routine. Uh, if you have more than one things causing interrupts, the first thing you have to do in your interrupt service routine is to figure out what, what actually caused the interrupt so you can take the appropriate action. On the, on the KL25Z, it has an, a vector table that vectors you to the specific location for your interrupt service routine that's written specifically for each interrupt. And so you don't have to waste any time figuring out what caused the interrupt because you, you're already automatically in your code for that particular interrupt because it's, it's, it has a hardware feature that, that allows it to direct the interrupt to that specific address using a table. And, and a, our little pick doesn't have that feature, but that's a nice feature. Uh, the return address gets pushed onto the stack. And then in the pick, there's shadow registers that hold the W register, the BSR, and a bunch of other registers. So, so you can use registers in the ISR. And when you return, all, all, all the registers that were being used by the mainline routine are restored to their natural values. Remember that a interrupt service routine can never, uh, can never uh, you can never pass a value to it and it will never return a value because it's not called in the mainline code. But if you want to uh, have variables that, that are shared between the mainline and the interrupt service routine, then you just have to make them global variables and both the interrupt service routine the main, and the main routine will, and, and for that matter, all other functions will have access to them. Um, all right, let's see, maybe one uh, LCD display. We'll talk a little bit about that. So the interface for the LCD display uh, has uh, 14 pins plus two additional pins to power the backlight. Uh, and the 14 pins have eight data pins, but when we use it with our, uh, I2C interface, the little interface board only used four of the data pins and we use it in four bit mode. And the four data pins that the interface board uses are the four high data pins. It uses data four, five, six, and seven. And it does not use data zero, one, two, and three. And then the three control lines that we really have to have controlled, uh, we have to have the, uh, the, the, uh, Uh, the RS line, the RW line, and the E line. The E line really works as a clock, pretty much. And that on that E line, uh, that on the edges of that E line, that's when data is latched into the display. And in four bit mode, it's latched in four bits at a time. So we have to do two writes. We have to transmit the, the high order nibble first, and then the low order nibble to give the eight bits that we want to send to the display. And if the RS line is, is low, then that'll, that will be a, uh, um, I forget. I think that'll be a, uh, I think that'll be data. And if it's high, it'll be a command. Maybe it's the other way around. And then our read write line uh, tells us whether we're gonna have a read or a write. So, uh, so when, so it's, it reads I think on a one and it writes on a zero. Um, so we have to control the E line, the read write line and the RS line. And then there's a little contrast line that you usually need to put a potentiometer on so you can adjust the, 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 you can adjust the contrast on the display and, and see it really well. And then there's power and ground. And our displays pretty much ran at five volts. You can get them that run at four volts. Um, so we talked to it through the I2C interface and, 
we had to have a couple of header files, an I squared C header and an, uh, and an LCD underscore I, I2C header file. And then we could send data to it and commands uh, through the functions that were uh, provided with those headers. Um, okay, we did temperature sensing. Uh, so we get an analog value out of our, out of our, uh, out of the, uh, either the internal sensor or the, uh, the, the in sensor on our analog board, which, uh, which is a, um, let's see, I thought I put that on there, but maybe I didn't, uh, I didn't. Yeah, well, anyway, we, we, we get that out. Um, let's see, what else? Um, the, the temperature sensor has a linear relationship of voltage with temperature. And so we A to D it, and then we use an equation and we can calculate the temperature. Uh, some temperature sensors uh, are, well, the, the one that we use here, the, the uh, MC um, 90, I think it's a 9700. That one is pre-calibrated. Uh, you can also get a couple of others. Some are, some are set up to be to be uh, to work more with centigrade, some with Fahrenheit, but you can always convert them, of course. Um, you have to input that information though on an A to D channel, and then take that A to D value uh, and and then uh, convert it to an actual temperature with a formula. Um, all right, uh, the internal temperature sensor on the pick though is not calibrated. It just gives you a rough idea of temperature, and you really do have to calibrate it if you want it to be very useful. Um, Okay, and let's see, GPIO. So remember, uh, make sure you know how to implement a switch. Uh, you know that, that if, if the switch connects the pin to ground, then you have to put a pull up on the micro pin. If the switch connects the pin to, to uh, v, VDD, then you have to put a pull down resistor. And the pull up a pull down resistor should be about 10K, something like that, to where it doesn't draw much current. Uh, but it but it uh, draws a, enough current fast enough that it's, it doesn't have a really long time constant. Um, you should know that the pin can sink and source about 25 uh, milliamps, um, and you have to you, and and it's going to provide it's you should provide the voltage level that the chip's running on for in, for an, for a one input and zero for an output. But there is a threshold where it changes, which you can find in the data sheet. I'm not going to ask you about that, but you should know that you you have you could find it in the data sheet. Um, so there are built-in pull-ups on the pins, but they're very very weak, and they they don't really work for anything very useful except to keep a pin from totally floating. So you can turn them on for the pins you're not using instead of having external uh, pull-up resistors on them. Um, our our all of our memory on the PIC is memory mapped so that uh, we use the exact same instructions uh, to control our general purpose random access memory as we do uh, our peripheral modules. Now in, in, the, uh, in, in your laptop and desktops, if they're running uh, you know, an IBM type system, uh, an AMD or, a, or, a, or, a, or an Intel chip, those chips are actually not memory mapped. Uh, they have special instructions for I/O, but uh, and which is definitely a legacy thing. Uh, no modern chip does that anymore. Um, all right, uh, I think that's about all I wanted to talk about. Um, the uh, maybe a word or two about I2C. You should know that the wires on the I2C C are driven with open collectors, uh, and they have to have pull-ups. And uh, there should just be one pull-up resistor on each line that you should know for I squared C that the clock is generated in the master and, but that the, the, that the data line is bi-directional. In, uh, in, in, in SPI, you should know that the clock is also generated in the master, but one of the, da one of the data lines is, is master out, slave in, and the other data line is master in, slave out. So the data lines are unidirectional. The clock, the clock line is unidirectional. And uh, the slave select line, also generated by the master, uh, turns on a slave and tells it to, to connect to the uh, buses. And <clears throat> it can then uh, untri-state its bus uh, connections. And so it can drive the, the, the data, the master in slave outlines, and then it can read the others. Um, 
So <clears throat> remember that for the most part, there are different size addresses for I squared C, but the vast majority of I squared C addresses are seven bit addresses and you shift them one bit to the left and append uh, a zero or one for whether you're gonna write or read. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, and usually we send eight bits at a time with I squared C and usually we send eight bits at a time with SPI. And usually with SPI, we usually send data in both directions, although the data in one of the directions may be dummy data, it doesn't really matter. But, but we do, we shift, uh, the 8-bit shift register in the master gets shifted to the slave, and the 8-bit in the shift register in the slave gets shifted to the master at the same time. So it's always transmitting it bidirectionally. Now you don't have to hook up both lines, so you, you might only be using it in one direction, but it's trying to shift data both ways. Okay, I think that's it. I think I'm going to quit with that. That should be a pretty good uh, review. Um, all right. Um, and if there's anything, uh, anything else, uh, um, you know, I, I, there are some exam, I think there's some example tests. I'll make sure they're visible on Blackboard. Do you guys have any questions? Anybody? Yeah, none for me. All right. Thanks, Ryan. All right. Well, I'll assume no questions. I do see one chat. Uh, so, yeah, we won't comment on that. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, let me stop the recording then.